I know that you will be with me when I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome through the valley of the shadow I will not fear Thank you, Linda. When I heard Linda sing that song the first time, I was just amazed. Uh, she did it when it, we were pretty much snowed out. There was only a few people here. Uh, but let, me, let me share with you a scripture. From the passage that Carrie read earlier, um, verse 35 of Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from, from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have troubles or calamities or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or are in danger or are threatened with death? No. 
Despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, obviously, Linda, I mean, you are, you are confronting a life-threatening situation. And how many of you right now would say, I have a major problem in my life that is beyond me to deal with? How many of you have a major problem in your life that is beyond you to deal with? What would you say to these people from what you've learned in this process? Press into Him. Press into God like the song says. I mean, you can't do it alone. I couldn't do it alone. I just had to spend time and time and time with the Lord. I mean, we drew so close. I just decided early on I wasn't going to waste this cancer. I was going to let it be my witness, my testimony. I was going to witness to my family. Um, I was just going to witness to as many people as I could, doctors, many, many doctors, people that I met. And I just tried to use it for good. And I tried to be transparent about my faith. Um, I just love the Lord. I've, I've learned so much through all of this. It's kept me on my knees. It's a shame sometimes that the valleys are what drive us to that. But I wouldn't change a thing because my relationship with God right now, with Jesus, is so tight. I mean, I just feel his presence. He's with me right this second. He was with me through that song, which was very difficult for me to sing because I knew Pastor Steve was going to have me talk after. I don't know what's worse, talking or singing sometimes. But when I look out there and I see my church, this beautiful church that I've been a part of for 27 years now, it's just amazing to me because my church family has supported me so much through this. Um, if you're alone out there, if you think you're alone, if you're going through anything, talk to somebody in this church. There's so many of us that will help. Pastor Steve is a wonderful shepherd. He visited me. He came and prayed with me in the hospital. And the one thing that I heard over and over from people, even from him that morning of my surgery, you have such peace, perfect peace. You know, and people that don't even know the Lord, I knew what he was talking about. I do, I have that peace with just Jesus. But people that don't know the Lord, like some of my family, they kept saying to me over and over through all of this, I don't know how you're doing it. Um, you're so strong. You, you just, you're just amazing. You're carrying on and just going on and on. And I kept saying, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. Maybe one day they'll get that. Amen. Because nothing can separate us from the Lord. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time of um, our stewardship as we uh, cue from there and recognize that if you're, if you're in this congregation right now and you're, you're thinking, I, I, I am confronting stuff that is so far beyond me, I have no idea how to tackle it or what to do, I've run out of my own road. That's really when God wants to reveal himself to you the most. And I'm praying that, that the God who loves you so much that he came to this earth to die for you, to be raised from the dead, so that he can offer you life and life more abundantly right now, he is here saying to you, don't go it alone. You were created to live a life with me, with your creator. But you've kept me out of your life. Welcome me in. Live with me rather than without me. And let me show you what that's like. Lord, right now we come to, to you and we pray that the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, would, would please receive these, these worship offerings and tithing and all of its stewardship to you, Lord. That as we go about our business and we conduct business all week long, you provide us the resources we need. You bless us with wealth. We in turn trust you. We tithe. We, if you speak to us about offering, we give over and above with regard to our offering. But all of it, Lord God, is for your glory. My prayer right now, Father, is that as, as we begin to speak more and more about what it means to trust you and believe in you and courageously live with you, even through the hardest times, that our faithful weekly stewardship, our general living, will be an experience of a life with you. 
rather than without you. And in part, that is heaven-like. So I pray that your power and spirit would anoint this service. All other Bible-believing churches in our area, we pray for Lighthouse and Severn Covenant and, and uh, uh, First Christian and Christ Church and all these other churches around our area that are seeking to minister today. I pray you bless those pastors and anoint that ministry. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Oh, I forgot my offering. I'll, I'll, I'll double up next service. So you, you have to leave. I don't have anything to give you right now. <laughs> if you got your Bible, would you please open up to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. I don't know what happened. I always usually have in my pocket or here and here. And I've left my envelope in the other room. Joshua chapter 6. Wouldn't it be terrible if ushers stood around you like they stand around me? Just, you know, doing <laughs> a little pressure there. I just want you to hold that passage for um, until we get to it in the sermon. But um, I'm really enthusiastic about this series that we're starting here uh, the Sunday after Easter. 2015, as Linda mentioned, and as the songs have mentioned, and as Pastor Kerry has mentioned, has all been about this theme of God being for us, to form us. You know, Linda would have never put cancer on her agenda. She would have never said, boy, I hope one day in my life I get to have cancer. Nobody does that. Nobody thinks like that. But when living in this broken, corrupt, uh, unhealthy, disease-riddled world, when we encounter these things by virtue of living this side of heaven, in this earth... We know we have an advocate with God. We can go to God and He will use these circumstances to accomplish His goal in our life. And His goal in our life is always to make us more like Jesus. Because as we are being made more and more like Jesus, we will experience the life that God always intended us to have. We have a life, but He intends for us to have a different life than we have right now. Even if you're following Jesus, He intends for you to be more like Him. He doesn't intend for you to punch your ticket to heaven and then live without Him. He intends for you to punch your ticket to heaven and then begin living your life with Him and becoming more like Him as He uses circumstances to form and shape you. And so this year has been all about that. God is for you to form you. In addition to that, the Lord has really challenged me to raise the profile of prayer in this particular congregation. And so I've been talking a good bit about that here and there. Our weekly prayer service on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock is about that. We used to have these prayer services every quarter, so we'd have four a year. But now we have them every week at 7 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. And if you're not involved in anything else that's going on on Wednesday night, I really hope you'll plan on getting here. It is a wonderful time to just listen to, to, listen to music, sing, to reflect on uh, quotes from church tradition like the Apostles' Creed and the doxology and, and the Lord's Prayer. It's an opportunity to find personal time of prayer, to sing, to fellowship together. It's a beautiful time. And I hope you'll plan on making that a regular part of your week. But on April 29th, we're having a special joint church-wide corporate prayer service. April 29th, so this is your time to take your phone out and start plugging it into your calendar. April 29th at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, we're having a corporate church-wide prayer service that we're shutting down everything else that goes on on Wednesday nights and we're coming together for this church-wide prayer service. And it's really on the heels of of this, or right, right towards the end of this series on courageous prayer. This series, in the context of God is for you to form you, is on courageous prayer because Romans 8 says, as we've said over and over, that God is for you. And if God is for you, then you can pray courageously. Now, there's a couple resources that I want to point your attention to. Uh, they're in your um, bulletin, actually, on the back side in the sermon notes section. Down the bottom, there's a couple books down there, some titles uh, that I think are very practical, very easy to read, very encouraging books. One of them, with open hands, our pastoral staff just finished going through. And I think if you ask any of them, they will tell you that it was a very transforming kind of experience. They had had a life of prayer 
But now their life of prayer is different. It's enhanced. It's, it's stronger because of going through that book. And so I want to encourage you, uh, use Amazon or whatever you use to order books or your Kindle or whatever it is, and get a copy of one or both of these books and begin reading through it. And I think you'll be blessed and encouraged. Now, the Circle Maker book that I recommend in there is an interesting, curious book written by Mark Batterson, pastor of National Community Church out of Washington, D.C. And he starts off the book by doing something that theologians and commentators like to do. He, he talks, he, he deals with excursus. Now, you're never going to use that word. Don't even bother writing it down. It's, it's called excursus. Now, what commentators and theologians and Bible scholars do is they often kind of go outside of the biblical uh, piece, biblical scriptures, and they use to elaborate and contextualize stories, history, uh, uh, events in political history or whatever is going on. They use that in order to be able to help us to understand more fully how the Bible, how Christianity, how the, how the people of Israel in the Bible have affected the world at large. And so they use these external, extra-biblical stories and things like that to be able to help us understand more and even better at times uh, about what goes on in the life of people outside the Bible and how the Bible and God is affecting them. And so Mark, in his book, The Circle Maker, starts off the book by talking about a prophet in Israel like... The prophets in the Bible, like Isaiah, and like Ezekiel, and like Amos, and Joel, and, and Obadiah, and all those. This prophet is in the vein of that. And humble, uh, private, um, dedicated, reflective, deeply, deeply in love with Jehovah God, the God of the Bible and trying to live life and lead the people of God the best way he can as God has called him to that kind of leadership. Josephus speaks of this prophet called Honai. Uh, the Talmud, the Mishnah, all of them reflect on this particular prophet that lived a generation before Jesus. Now you might say, well, why would we consider, you know, this story. It's, it's not in the Bible, so who cares about it? Well, Jesus cares about it, because Jesus used lots of stories that weren't in the Bible. What? Yeah, Jesus used lots of stories. He made up stories. He, he told stories about, about uh, things that happened in, you know, previous times, like, uh, you know, Herod Antipodus, when he, when he ransacked the temple and mingled the blood of people and animals together, and he told that story. It's not in the Bible, except when Jesus pulled it out and used it. He told a story of towers falling in on people and how it relates to particular ills and problems. That story is not a matter of biblical record until Jesus made it a matter of biblical record. So Jesus used all kinds of stories and examples and events and pulls it all in. He didn't just talk about Moses or just talk about Elijah. He talked about lots of things that relate to to the principles he's getting at. And the Lexham Bible Dictionary uh, deals with the story of Honai in order to help us understand how God used people and influenced people with courageous prayer that potentially affected the future. Because Honai lived the generation before Jesus did. And his prayer regarding rain and an incredible drought that was going on during the, the generation before Jesus Many say saved a whole generation of people. Well, guess who was a part of that generation? The parents of Mary and Joseph. So this story is quite relevant to even what we're talking about today. So let me share the story with you. It was the first century BC and a devastating drought threatened to destroy a whole generation. The generation before Jesus. The last of the Jewish prophets had died off nearly 400 years before, but there was one man named Honai, an eccentric Jewish sage, who lived outside the walls of Jerusalem. He had a reputation of holiness and dedication to Jehovah God, and a courageous prayer life, especially concerning rain. And in an agricultural society, when rain is plentiful, it's an afterthought. But during a drought, it's the only thought. 
And Honai was their only hope for salvation in this time of drought. Famous for his ability to pray for rain, it was on this day, the day, that Honai would earn his moniker, the circle maker. With a six-foot staff in his hand, Honai began to turn like a math compass. He drew a circle around himself and stood inside the circle he had drawn. And then he dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven with the authority of the prophet Elijah who called down fire from heaven. Honai called down rain. Lord of the universe, he prayed. I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The word sent a ripple through the city that day. And it wasn't just the volume of his voice, it was the authority of his tone. Not a hint of doubt. This prayer did not originate in the vocal cords. Like water from an artesian well, the words flowed from the depth of his soul. His prayer was resolute, yet humble. Confident, yet meek. Expectant, yet unassuming. Perhaps this is why most Bible historians compare Honai to Habakkuk, who prayed in a similar way. Then it happened. As his prayer ascended to the heavens, raindrops descended to the earth. An audible gasp swept through and across the thousands of congregants who had encircled his circle. Every head turned heavenward as the first raindrops parachuted from the sky, but Honai's head remained bowed. The people rejoiced over each drop, but Honai was not satisfied with the sprinkle. Still kneeling within the circle, Honai lifted his voice over the sounds of celebration. Not so much for this rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns and pits and caverns. The sprinkle turned into such a torrential downpour that eyewitnesses said no raindrop was smaller than an egg in size. It rained so heavily and so steadily that the people fled to the temple mount to escape the flash floods. Honai stayed and prayed inside his protracted circle. Once more, he refined his bold prayer. Not so much for rain like this have I prayed, but for rain of thy favor, blessing, and graciousness. And then, like a well-proportioned sun shower on a hot and humid August afternoon, it began to rain calmly and peacefully. Each raindrop was a tangible token of God's grace. And they didn't just soak the skin, they soaked the spirit of the faithful. It would be forever remembered as the day. The day thunderclaps applauded the Almighty. The day puddle jumping became an act of praise. The prayer that saved a generation was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. The circle he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol and the story of Honai stands forever as a testament to the power of a single courageous prayer for water to fall from heaven to change the course of history. Perhaps in part, making way for the living water to rain down from heaven on those who are thirsty for God. And I share that story with you because it provides us a context what do people do? We can look at folks like Moses and David and Paul and we can say, yeah, but they're in the Bible. They're special. Well, what if people outside the Bible, like say you, like say me, decided that we were in fact going to pray in the same vein that a Moses or a David or an Elijah prayed? In fact, in the book of James, it says, Hey, Elijah was a guy just like us. And it goes on to tell us to pray. Pray courageously. So we're reading an example right here of a guy who took that to heart, just like you, just like me. Not in the Bible, not some special called out unique person, but a, but a guy who just believed God could do anything. The Bible in Judeo-Christian history, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is full of examples of courageous prayer. Prayers that defy physics. Prayers that defy tradition. Prayers that defy reason. Prayers that defy other gods. Prayers that defy our own doubt. I mean, in our recent history, there was one of these prayers. In fact, we all who were here 
were involved in it. I'm talking about the renovation of this sanctuary. In 2012, we got to the end of 2012 and we had the best financial year we had ever had in a long time. I was over the moon with, with the increasing strength and it didn't seem like there was any end in sight. Things were going to just get better and better as time went. And, and, and I came out of that year just so enthusiastic and, I, and we had been talking about this sanctuary because we hadn't touched it for 30 years. The carpet was tearing, the pews were breaking, the lighting was inefficient. It was just a tr it was something around our neck that we knew we were going to have to deal with but we didn't know when. And we kept putting it off and kept you know saying, well, this is this too much to bite off? It's a $300,000 nut to crack. That's a lot in a depressed economy. Because this is not, we'll take away from the tithe and offering. This is in addition to the tithe and offering, we've got to come up with three hundred grand. But at the end of 2012, I told the leadership, I think this is the time. I think this is the time to pull the trigger. I really feel like the Lord would have us to do this. <laughs> January, we fell off the cliff. Do you remember the talk about the fiscal cliff? You remember that, you know, a couple years ago? Well, what happened in our church, we, we weren't at the government fiscal cliff. So, you know, sequestration occurred and drawdown on contracts and people were losing jobs. And in January, boom, it hit. And our finances in this church dropped off like never before. And I went back to the leadership and said, hey, I was just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, that's what it felt like. It was like, hey, listen, it's not Palm Sunday yet, uh, so we can pull the tree. We can pull it and not do it. It's okay. You know, but, but the leadership kind of rallied around and there were some that didn't believe and some that didn't want to do it. But most of us decided that it was the right time and we were going to press on. We were going to pray courageously and we were going to trust God. And that's when God gave us the vision that this is a faith-raising campaign. Not a fundraising campaign. It's a faith-raising campaign. And so we had $300,000 to raise over and above our regular budget just to barely meet expenses. We had to come with three hundred grand over that. You had to help us. And we asked you to pledge like like never before that you would help us to do that and you did and miracle after miracle and story after story came in rolled in until we went through the whole 2014,000 season and and we dedicated this sanctuary last year on Easter I just want to reflect on that for a moment I just want to sit back and say wow let's look what God did watch the video Thank you. 
Can you clap? <laughs> All that work done in four minutes. It was a really great project. Hey, that, you know, that's really not the end of it. Um, not only did we raise the $300,000 cash to be able to do everything we did in here, but we, but we right now are still using the surplus to do other major projects that related to our church. God, not, God did over and above what we asked him. And that is exactly the way that God responds when we courageously believe that he can do anything. Let's look at another time in the history of God's people when he called his folks to just make a circle. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people of God were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. Verse 2. But the Lord said to Joshua, and this is really important, so very highlight that, underline that. The Lord said to Joshua, here's the deal, you don't tell God what to do. You don't tell God what to do. In this kind of courageous prayer, you are, you are led by God to pray, to circle something, to, to make as a priority in prayer. When the Lord speaks to you, and you know it, you can trust that He is for you to form you through the process of that prayer. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. It's king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can, and then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. So Joshua called together the priest and said, Take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, March around the town and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and some behind the ark with the priest continually blowing the horns. Do not shout, do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day. And then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. And Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests carried, again, carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horn marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town tw uh, once and returned to their camp. The following pattern was held for the next six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on the horn, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Skip to verse 20. When the people did what the Lord had commanded, that's important, when the people did what the Lord had commanded, suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Has God identified in your life a Jericho? You may have never thought about that before. You may have never imagined, what? That's a Bible thing. That's not a, a Steve thing or a Joan thing or an Ed thing. That's, that's a Bible story. That's not for me. You, you are totally mistaken. You have misunderstood. Honai 
is a description of an extra biblical character who believed in the God of the Bible. And he, and he risked an audacious prayer. And God said to the children of Israel, Hey, I want you to do this really kooky thing. I want you to wander around this city several times, encircling it several times and over a period of time. And then I want you to shout and blow horns. And, and by the way, I'm just going to collapse all the, all the walls. Not a shot fired. Not a battering ram used. And God just did it by the people trusting that God would do what he said he was going to do. Honai, Joshua, and you. You and me. What giant, formidable thing do you feel God leading you to courageously pray about? Now immediately we like to default to our biggest ticket need. Like we immediately go there and say, it must be this. But maybe not, maybe, maybe not. I mean, it wasn't like Joshua said, you know what, I've looked at all the cities and I think this one's the best one to take. No, God, direct, God said to Joshua, I want you to take this city because I'm giving it to you. So you in prayer have the opportunity, like Joshua, like Honai, to say, Lord, would you have me pray about this? This is big. This is beyond me. I, I can't do this. And God says, exactly. That's exactly my point. I'm going to do it. I just want you to join me in the courage of it. Trust me. What big, giant, formidable thing might God be leading you to pray about? It'll be likely something that defies your reason. It'll be something that definitely defies your comfort. It'll be something that defies your logic. But He wants you to take the prayer risk and courageously, maybe even publicly, Declare what you're praying about. It might involve an unhealthy behavior that you've never quite been able to get victory over. It might involve money or a job or health or a major life change. Maybe it involves a lost or wayward family member that you have, are so burdened for and God places on your heart and said, that's the Jericho. What might God be leading you to encircle? Now, there's nothing magic about a circle. There's nothing magic about parading around something seven times. You know, if that was the case, I'd parade around the MVA seven times. You know, and have all those walls of protocol drop, and me be able to get through, the, you know, in ten minutes, what takes me, what feels like ten hours. You know, there's nothing magic about that kind of stuff. For, for that matter, there's nothing magic about prayer. It's not, you know, you tick off these three little mumbo-jumbos and abracadabra, there it is. There's nothing magical about prayer. Prayer is not about what you want. Prayer is not about what I want. Prayer is about what God wants for us. And when we decide that we're going to stop talking and stop giving God his to-do list through our prayer, and we're going to start listening for agenda items that he's got, then we'll be able to say, there's my Jericho. There's what I can draw a circle around. There's what I can pray about. God is for you. He wants you to know that. And whatever He inspires you to draw a circle around, to pray about, so to speak, He intends to use, to form you into the image of His Son Jesus. And this will bless your life. The way in which this occurs is amazing as God calls his people to do just what I'm describing. And as we come out of Easter, the ultimate miracle, and we recognize that God became flesh, dwelt among us, died on a cross and rose from the dead and now offers life to you and me, abundant life, that's the greatest miracle of all. Everything else should pale in comparison. And so strategically, I've placed this series right here to say to you, you might think, ah, God wouldn't want to mess with that. Maybe he does. 
Maybe that big, huge, giant thing out there that you just never imagined you could actually make a part of prayer and trust God for. Maybe that's exactly what God is calling you to put in that circle. And you know he's not wanting you to just put that in the circle. He wants you in the circle. He wants you trusting Him. He wants you getting on your knees or, or, or calling out to Him or whatever it is, just as He did Honai. He wants you in that circle. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to have that confidence because He is for you. And if you believe that, exercise it. If you don't believe that, get in the circle anyway and pray He'll help your unbelief. Remember that guy in the Gospels who said, Jesus said, you know, you believe I can do this? And he said, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's not big, huge, giant, rock star spiritual people that get prayers answered. It's, it's the woman with an issue of blood that just passes by in faith that maybe even just passing by. Maybe his very presence will heal her, and it did. Maybe being mindful to God and, and His power and His interest in being for you will actually move you to courageously begin to pray. I invite you today. Today we're starting this little series on prayer and, and I'm inviting you to begin asking God what He wants you to encircle in prayer. Don't be loose with this. Don't be loose uh, with this. Write it down. Draw a circle if you want and name it inside the circle. Raise it up on the prayer radar screen every single day. Put it in your car, up on your, your, your uh, mirror in your bathroom or something like that, on your refrigerator. Be open to listening to God's voice. He wants to identify your Jericho, what He wants to encircle. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you about what God is doing with this, these Jerichos, with these prayer circles. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to share with you what I believe God has spoken to me about regarding heritage and our Jericho or our prayer circle. And I'm going to be inviting you to join me in circling the wagons in prayer. And I hope you'll join me. Would you stand with me? We're going to take a few moments and just reflect. And so I want to, be, I want to ask you to, during this time, um, there's a wide variety of responses. Now, there's elders will be here, you know, and if you want to come and receive communion, you can receive communion. And some other spiritual response team members that will be happy to pray with you and for you and whatever it might be. I mean, it might be a health issue. It might be a, a matter of a, a family member or something in your own life you just want to pray about. Or, or you might want to thank God for something. Maybe you just want to spend time and pray yourself here. Just worshiping and thanking God in the altar, in the, in the, in the seats. But I, but I want to invite you to, to also get beyond that and to begin thinking about what God might be speaking to you about. You might say, God's speaking. I think He only speaks to the pastors and priests, right? No. God speaks to you. He speaks to me. God loves you just like He loves me. God is for you in your life like He's for me in my life. And I'm inviting you to ask Him. Begin asking Him. Don't, don't identify it just yet. Just keep praying about it, wondering about it. And in a couple weeks, I'm going to ask you to let me know what's in your circle. What's your Jericho? And then we're going to, I'm going I'm to join you in prayer about it. But right now, you just might want to come find somebody to pray with and talk with or... Or you might want to just sing and worship. I just want to invite you to just relax. Just like Jim said at the beginning of the service, just take a moment to imagine that God actually wants to interact with you right now. So, so would you do that? Just through the lyric and the music or a response or whatever it is, just let God begin to talk and interact with you. So let's lift our voice, church. Thank you, God. We humble ourselves before you. We lift up our voice. We bring nothing to receive everything. In the name of Jesus. You spoke.
so far from heaven's throne, clothed in human form, you showed the world the Father's love. You gave, you gave life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave. Your grace is broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me. For me. Thank you, Lord. Reflect on these lyrics. Let them be yours. If you lack for words, let the lyric be your word. You lived a sinless life, yet you were crucified. You bought our freedom on the cross. Thank you, God. Forsaken for our sin, you died and rose.
as we prepare to sing our last song, maybe there are some of you in the congregation today that have, that have never received His life. Maybe you've never recognized Him in His life that He actually sacrificed that for you. I don't know. Maybe there's some of you today that have been living far from God, but you, you want to start afresh. You want to start anew. Well, as I mentioned last week, it's as simple as ABC. You admit that you actually are a sinful human being, like everybody else. Nobody's more sinful than anybody else. But you know you are a sinful human being, and you need the forgiveness of Christ that He gives, gives from the cross. So you admit that. B, you believe that Jesus actually was the Son of God. He came and did what He did. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And He's here to give you life today. You believe that. To resurrect you just like He was resurrected. He, he's ready here to do that for you today. You believe that. A, you admit. B, you believe. C, you commit. You commit to living and loving Him for the rest of your life. If you, if you want to pray with somebody to do that, these folks are down here. They'll be happy to pray with you and talk with you and lead you through the ABCs. You can do that in your seat. You can do that worshiping where you are. You can do it before you go to bed tonight. But I, I always recommend getting out of your seat and coming to a place and meeting somebody. and join, That's, a, that's a, that, the best way to do it. And then church, for you that have done that, I know you've got 10,000 praises to sing. So, so let's sing this song in the context of that exhortation. 10,000 reasons to praise. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. Worship His hope. Sing like